So it's in conservation with yet again. I'm David Lindo, also known as Jürgen Berda. And for those unfamiliar with in conservation with, it's a series of Zoom interviews in which I talk to people. Actually, they're more than people to me. They are trendsetters. They are, you know, the movers and shakers within the world of conservation about their projects, about their books, about their love, about all sorts of stuff. And it's not just birds, it's all sorts of subjects. I mean, the other day, in fact, yesterday, we had um, uh, my friend Darren Naish here talking about uh, cryptozoology. So we've got all sorts of subjects. So um, without any further ado, and by the way, before I even carry on, I must say this. If you're watching this in the future on YouTube, please like and subscribe and tell all your friends, get everyone to watch In Conservation with all the previous uh, interviews there's so many people and as i said so many different subjects but anyway let me introduce to you folks michael copleston who is the director of rspb england the royal society for protection of birds england so michael how are you and where are you oh thank you david yeah i'm really well really really well and uh yeah lovely to be here to say hello to everyone and speak to you personally um i'm based up on the um the trent valley so um i moved down here back in 2008 from uh living up on isla actually on the west coast of scotland and i moved here with the rspb um just outside uh lincoln and newark next to the mighty river trent so that's where i'm sat right now it's funny because we've had a few uh members of staff from the rspb over the years and Everyone that I've spoken to on In Conservation with have this really strong bond with the organisation and are very, very positive and very kind of driven. Um, why is that? Are you guys trained in that way or you just is it really how things are? Yeah, I think I'm really blessed. I think, I mean, I've got a wonderful group of people that work in the England team um top to bottom they're special people they're incredibly talented but they're passionate and I think that one thing that you can see is that I feel that the RSPB and many other organizations that work in conservation they they both have people that work for a cause but they want to bring their skills they want to bring their talent and their time and and see what they can contribute um so hopefully that comes through um yeah I I grew up you know, really, I was that classic sort of like um, young boy interested in being outdoors all the time, climbing trees, chasing things, looking out into the, the countryside, spending most of my time in rivers, turning over rocks. Um, and yeah, I, I was that little boy that had the, the birds brought to his house that were sick and injured and happened to look at them and try and help them on their way. And then eventually I found the RSPB, you know, through the Young Ornithologist Club. So I then went into other things for a while, but I came back to it. I, I said I, I actually studied psychology at university, but ended up even doing psychology, some stuff on on robin behavior. So I looked at evolutionary behavior of um, of, uh, of birds and particularly songbirds. And that suddenly brought me right back into focus with what I might be able to do as a career. And um, and then the, the RSPB sort of came back to me again. I was like the opportunity to be able to to, to work and, and do something that I loved as a passion and a hobby so yeah that's kind of where i started yeah because i met you um bc before covid that's a new phrase i've learned recently um <laughs> yes. about um must have been about seven years ago i was doing a program yeah. i was presenting a program for bbc radio 4 and i journeyed up to sherwood forest a place that i hadn't really been to before and i was really impressed um with that forest actually because it's one of the few forests I've been to, or woodland areas in Britain, or certainly in England anyway, that I've been to, where I can actually hear the buzzing of insects and where I can actually see the gnarled old oaks still standing because a lot of these places you go to, um, these woodlands are so mm. manicured. Anything that's old or falling down, they'll just chop it down straight away without any thought to, you know, what other sort of biodiversity biodiversity could be using it so it's kind of um it was really refreshing but also obviously I met you and it was a, it was a good uh, day we had wasn't it it was great yeah and it's um it's the people's forest as well wasn't it I remember you saying to me it was one of the few places you'd ever come where yeah you were you know stacked out with wildlife around us but you saw a real diversity the people that were coming there you know and 
And in truth, you know, not everyone had a pair of binoculars. In fact, it was very rare to see a pair of binoculars at Sherwood Forest, even though, you know, you've got, you know, red stars and lesser spotted woodpecker and nightjar and woodlark and all these incredible things. And they're there. And if you want to go and find them, you can. But there's people that absolutely love Sherwood Forest just because of what it represents, that kind of egalitarian value. And and, and it's got a really interesting story. I mean, those um those oaks you, you saw and we looked at together, those ancient oaks, I mean, some of them are 600 years old, some of them are over a thousand years old. The things they've seen is astonishing. And they're like living sculptures, aren't they? Some of them are dead. And in fact, half of them, you know, should be dead. It should be full of dead wood in some ways. That's what a lot of the invertebrates live and survive on. That's their uh, that's their niche, their ecosystem. But those trees are only there for a very strange reason. And um, if you go back in time, a lot of our trees, particularly oaks, were were harvested for the creation of boats or sometimes those big eaves that you see in cathedrals and um, the oaks at Sherwood Forest that have now become if you like the treasure the real gems they were the rejects they were the ones that were too gnarly they were the ones that are out of shape and couldn't be used but um but over that time the landowner um that that owned Sherwood Forest and continues to do so to this day it was kind of protected it was like a classic sort of royal hunting forest over time as I said I, I moved down to the um this area back in 2008 and I started on a, a wetland site my my big focus was working on ex-mineral sites and creating new reserves but then I started to work in other places and in Nottinghamshire there was a wonderful heathland there one of the biggest heathlands still in the Midlands it's called Budby Heath it's about 250 hectares in size so still quite significant and intact and it's adjacent to the rest of Sherwood Forest and much of that whole landscape would have been oak woodland and heathland and much of it's been lost i mean we're talking a tiny tiny fraction is now left of what was once there um and we started a relationship looking at how to manage that heathland and then lo and behold opportunities came around to um to basically build a new visitor place a, a new visitor center if you like that was um going to take it out of where it was because it was built in the triple si so the site of special scientific interest right next to some of these mighty oaks so it was in the wrong place as much as it was loved for what it was it wasn't in the right place so we worked on a project there going way back um back into um yeah 20 probably about 2014 i probably started working on that and then by about 2017 yeah we got ourselves a, a new visitor center but importantly we managed to bring together the management of that heathland and the woodland and there's now a 500 hectare block of um of open you know environmental sort of like management which is all brought into one place and um and yeah those oaks those ancient oaks you know the, the key thing is that they're one of the uh, the biggest cohorts of ancient oaks anywhere in europe let alone in england and uh yeah they're quite remarkable so it's a great day really good to see you there yeah so as you said about the diversity i was really shocked because i remember doing a piece to well not camera but piece to microphone and seeing a, a, a black couple walking past me in, in the middle of the forest. And I had to stop and say, whoa, you know, because I've never actually seen that before in, in England ever. So that was uh, that was yeah. a, a real kind of testament to A, the attraction of the area and B, the work that you guys were doing to get people to come. Yeah, I mean, it's so important. I mean, I think I mean, we talk about it and it, and it can't be. It can't be tokenistic. It's got to be, you know, genuine. But there's that recognition that, you know, nature needs to be for everyone. And there's no doubt that some nature reserves have, have typically been places where people have felt that they have to stay on the outside as opposed to be on the inside. And it's quite hard to turn around the culture around that. But at the same time, you've got to keep working on it. And I think one of the key things with Sherwood was that we recognised that it was a place which had both the cultural heritage, the local heritage and the environmental heritage. And it's a destination, it's no doubt, it's a destination that people want to come to and hear about the stories. So we wanted to embrace that and sort of build upon that. So yeah, and, and long may it continue. It's, it's really a key thing for us there. Good. Well, since those days, you've now gone up in the world. You're now leading a, a team, uh, the RSPB um, team in England, working, as you put it, on big levers to pull for nature, such as policy, policy changes, fundraising, and people engagement, which obviously you're great at, as well as management and development of over 100 incredible nature reserves, such as Hamwall in Somerset, uh, or the Avalon Marshes, mm. uh, Sherwood Forest, of course, Benton Cliffs, amongst um, other places. 
Um, but today, actually, we're talking about something which I'm quite excited about. We're talking about the UK's Wild Bird Superhighway. And it's something that, um, I mean, I put it out there now, I'm going to say this. I love wetlands. I mean, for me, it's funny, I only realised in the last couple of years that I actually prefer wetlands to any other habitat. I've been walking around jungles in, in Ecuador and Colombia thinking, take me to a wetland. And I remember once being in Colombia in a jungle looking up or chasing shadows effectively and hearing things about a million miles away. And suddenly we came to a clearing and it was a wetland. And I actually said, leave me here. I'll see you later. You know, I just, <laughs> absolutely, excuse me, absolutely love the idea of wetlands. And I think that this whole project, which I kind of knew a little sort of bits of, has now come to this sort of, fruition and it's this big thing now which i want you got you to tell me about because um you know i think these guys the zoomers here as well as people in the future would be loving loving to hear you know how things have developed since uh since the early days of this project beginning yeah no thank you that's, that's really kind to say it as well and i think i'm in the same fan club like i i've worked on all types of habitats but there's something about weapons there's um I love being close to the water, whether it's, you know, the tides, the oceans or whether it's the rivers or, you know, the wetlands. There's something about it, isn't there? That's incredible. It kind of I think it's quite therapeutic. But um, but yeah, you can I think with wetlands, you can suddenly find yourself almost like wall to wall surrounded by birds. And I don't think there's many other places that can do that. You know, you're in this incredible landscape. And when you sort of think about the East Coast wetlands, I think if you think about the UK, some of the wildest places that we've got are not necessarily at the top of the mountains. They're on our coasts. You know, these are huge, sprawling mud flats, you know, great big estuaries, huge sort of like salt marshes. And they go on for miles, like miles and miles. The tide will sort of range out into the distance. You can't see it. And then when it races back in, you know, the whole place is rammed full of birds. And you can literally, like I say, be hit by a wall of birds flying over your head, whether it's you know, pink-footed geese or Brent geese or not, or, you know, a, a big, big stack of sandling all just arriving at the same time. So there's something really special about wetlands. I couldn't agree more. And I think, I mean, we've been we've been working in this space for a long time. And I think that it's always important to re recognise where you're standing on the shoulders of giants in some ways. And I think there's always, you're trying to almost take the baton and take it in a, you know, take it on for the next lap and see what you could do to make things better. So the thing with the East Coast wetlands, um, what was fascinating for me was when we kind of started the ball rolling, we were looking at what do we have across the, the whole network of, of England, if you like, um, and, and what our big contributions were going to be to doing things at scale and things that are going to be really of significant importance. And um, we started to frame it from the perspective of knowing that from the Humber, you know, down to the Thames and arguably even further, we've got this contiguous network of really important sites. And we've already got lots of, you know, very well-known nature reserves along that stretch. You know, places like Titchwell, places like Minsmere, they're real favorites for people. People go there and they see incredible stuff. And then we've got some of the places that are a bit more hidden, you know, some of the places that you won't necessarily get to um, as easily. Like I say, they're a bit harder to, to, to find. And even some of the new places that we've created almost from scratch, places like Frampton um, on the wash, Frampton Marsh has now become some of people's, you know, favourite place to go because you've got so many birds there. So we've got all of that work and it was a case of, well, how do we string that together? How do you make it sort of add up? Because when you look at things individually, sometimes you don't see the bigger picture. And I think that was one of the really important things here. We, we recognise that from a national perspective, one of the key things that we could look at was this is an important, a globally important network of sites. You know, when we look at that East Coast flyway and again, talking about the East Coast flyway for many audiences, they're just like, what is that? And from a communications perspective, at first you think, well, we better not use that phrase because nobody knows what it is. But I found out that it's actually better to sometimes say something that people don't know because they end up going, well, what is it? Like, And that was really noticeable where, um, you know, Colin Murray on Radio 5 Live did an interview with us and he was like really, really passionate. It was like, I've never heard of this. What is it? So. And that's great. So our very first thing was, OK, this is globally important. We've got literally millions, millions of birds that are coming from the Arctic down to Africa. And this is an epicenter like this place is like world class mud packed out with invertebrates. It's such a key passage point. It's like a service station for, for so many birds. 
So what do we need to do about it? Well, the fact is that not many people know it. Not many people know that that's the case. Um, and so first and foremost, we've got to raise that profile. We've got to think about how do we get people to know and celebrate and recognize what we've got. And one of the key things about doing that was looking at whether, you know, um, tentative listing for world heritage status would be an option. Now, I've worked abroad with um, RSPB colleagues in other places, places like China, for example, working on big wetlands out there. And I, we were always thinking we're, we're always going to other places and advocating or learning from what's happening in other places, and then trying to bring it back. And you could just see that, you know, here in the UK, we haven't got a world heritage status um, site, which is designated for um for nature for biological reasons um if you like that that's one of the key things so we've got lots of places from a heritage perspective and we've even got a couple of places from a geological perspective like the jurassic coast but there is some really important nature in the uk and particularly along the sea coast of of england and so it's trying to put it on a level and it sounds crazy but it's like it's recognizing actually this is as important as places like you know the great barrier reef or the galapagos islands this is a very special place so that was our first thing. And what we had, and funnily enough, the link to Sherwood is is really real as well, actually, because um as uh back in yeah, 2019, I think it was, we had a chat, we got all of our team together and we sat down, we talked about the fact that this East Coast wetlands was a thing. And the team, particularly one of them, our area managers on that Norfolk and uh, Lincolnshire coast called uh, Steve Rowlands, um He's a, he's a great sort of PR person. So he was saying, oh, just imagine if you were a white-tailed seagull and you were flying along the coast from the Humber down to the Thames, what would you see? You know, would you see that incredible interconnected array of sites? Um, and let's see if we can bring that to life. So that was the starting point. And there's so much more to it than that, because I think one of the key things, once we realised that was the start of our journey, and it is still very much the start, we need to sort of piece together all those things that are really important. And so when you look at those places like the Wallaceys that we've created from scratch, you know, incredible partnerships working with, um, you know, new people, people that you wouldn't usually expect to, to work with. So they're working with those that are digging the tunnels underneath London to create new tube lines, using that material to create wetlands on a massive scale um, and then doing all of the managed realignments or the tidal exchanges, all that kind of stuff. Um, we've actually got to be really proud of that. You know, we've done more of that in the UK than in many places. And so not only have you got this really important place for wildlife in terms of adaptation, trying to work with the grain of nature, but trying to find ways to solve the issues that we all face now. And, and this is the reality. We can see that some things are baked in. Sea level rise is projected to rise over 50 centimetres, maybe even up to a metre over the next 100 years. So all these precious places that are important for both people, for wildlife, for business, there is pressure there. And so working out how you can put in place, if you like, the mitigation for that, but make it better in the long run, that's become the real driver. So um, that's where it started. But it's just that first, that real sort of nugget is the fact that this place is really special. And um, and yeah, for me, my first platform was to go to the cop that we had in Glasgow and sit amongst a cast of people from across the world and talk about how important our coasts were and particularly tidal areas. And um, and we realised that, yeah, this is really important. So we're, we're getting some progress now. And the fact that the government started this tentative listing and we put something forward, we work with a lot of partners, National Trust, you know, Wildfowl and Wetlands Trust, the Crown Estate, local authorities. You know, it's a real team effort. It's not just RSPB. This has got to be everyone pulling in the same direction and um and it got accepted so it's on that tentative listing and now there's a lot of work ahead but yeah it's super exciting because yeah, i was going to ask you about the because it obviously it's a, a contiguous as you say array of different nature reserves and other areas and obviously they're not owned or owned by the rspb so obviously there was a lot of people mm -hmm. involved in this and i guess the question i want to ask was was it uh was it clear to people that they should be part of this where there's some bodies no, you don't have to mention anyone but in terms of you know local councils or whatever that kind of weren't up for it or didn't see the vision straight away yeah i mean yeah obviously and i think that's that's the thing you've got to you've got to have patience with some of this i mean it's um and you've got to have an open mind because you know where you want to get to but it's going to take a lot of different ways to try and get there sometimes what we found was that there was an incredible amount of support i mean this is 
we're in interesting times. I think there's a greater level of awareness of, you know, the impact of potential climate crisis, biodiversity crisis. You know, these things are very present now. They weren't necessarily, you know, 20 years ago. So they're different times for us, I think. We know that some of these things are getting worse. You know, state of nature is sort of, our, you know, identifying that. But at the same time, there's a lot of hope there because I think there are more people, more groups, more organisations that are in this space. And I think this is the the key thing. It isn't just about one organisation now. It's it's clear that you've got to do things at scale and some of this stuff is going to be quite hard to do. And if you're going to do it at scale, it's going to be hard. You need You need people brought in. So I would say that there are some really forward thinking local authorities that recognize that that's the case. I think sometimes you've got to look at what's the drivers, what's the thing that's really catching, you know, if you like, what's on their mind, what's on you know, their list of things. And the reality is if we look along that coastline, we can see that there are definitely some pressures from that coastal squeeze already in some places. So the erosion of, of both habitat, but what we would term as sea defenses is a real pressure for some places. Uh, the protection of, if you like, really important habitats for the benefit that they bring to fisheries is, again, another really obvious um, or not necessarily obvious, but it's a really become a very clear um, thing that's going to be important into the future. So important for fisheries, important for sea defences and flood alleviation. And again, the thing with the habitats, we, we know that things like salt marsh, for example, it reduces what's the um, the attenuation. So the pressure of the high tides under storm conditions can really batter our coasts. And what you find is if you have that, that um, if you like, a buffer of salt marsh that goes from the mudflats to salt marsh back into the terrestrial habitats, it affords such a significant protection from a flood perspective. And, um, and losing that habitat has become ever more understood. So these nature-based solutions to these things that we see as being an issue for, for us as humans, if you like. So that's become a real driver. And then lastly, it's all about net zero again. So what you now find is that people are looking at and going, okay, we've really got to do what we can with emissions. What are we going to do? And again, that kind of drive to think about, well, have we got to plant more trees? Um, yes, you know, the right ones in the right places. Um, can we do more with our peat bogs? Absolutely, these are important carbon sinks and we've got to protect those. And then suddenly people go, well, what about what about salt marsh? What about all, you know, um, seagrass, for example? What about these mud flats? And it turns out that some of these habitats on our coasts are more effective than rainforests at sequestering carbon out and locking it in. And so you've got this kind of multiple drivers now. These these are drivers, but they're now recognised as benefits. And I think that has changed a lot of people's minds about what there is that's an overlapping interest. Um, you know, so where we were maybe 15 years ago with projects like Medmory on the south coast, I don't know if you've heard of Medmory, but um, Medmory near Pagham Harbour, for example, that was a place where every single year the Environment Agency and the local authorities were battling, you know, flooding that was occurring, that was affecting homes, it was affecting roads, affecting businesses. And the only protection from the flooding that was coming from the sea was a shingle beach. And it was mounded up every year by these fleet of bulldozers to the cost of anywhere up to half a million pounds a year. And the risk of flooding was stated as being 100 percent on an annual basis, like it's going to flood every year. This is the best we can do. Now, Medbury then became this incredible project where there was one of the very first and one of the largest, if you like, um, managed realignments. So it's open coast. So it's recognizing that you can create um, a space where the water can come in, create new habitats, but alleviate the pressure. And you can control, if you like, in the best way and work with the grain of nature. Now that work's been done, you've got hundreds of hectares of more habitat. You've got significantly improved consideration for the local community because they were bought into the process. But importantly, the flood risk from an annual perspective has dropped from 100% down to 0.1%. And that's probably worth about 80 million, possibly more every year. And so these nature based solutions have now become more recognized as in, yeah, we can do this and it does work. And there's economic, social and environmental benefits. Um, and it's not just, you know, a, a pipe dream. These things can happen. So that's been really powerful, really powerful, too. It's a shame we can't shake our government awake to to see some of these nature based um, solutions to our problems. Um, but that's probably another subject that uh, 
can be talked about another day. But basically, we're talking about a large area for the uh, for the East Coast wetlands. Uh, for those who may not know the geography of England that well, we're talking about sort of north on the East Coast, all the way down over the wash, around the bump of East Anglia. And how, how far south does it go? I mean, technically, it comes down to the Solent. And so I think when we look at that migratory route and where the birds are kind of arriving, landing, feeding and moving, I mean, the real epicentre is probably the wash. We know it's the biggest, most protected area. And that's where there's um, you know a high proportion of birds coming in. Um, but there's no doubt that there's habitat. And in truth, there's habitat further north than that, too. But you kind of sometimes you've got to work out um, how do you make um, an ideal sort of like biogeographical shape size that can kind of speak to people. So from the Humber to the Solent is probably what we're looking at. But absolutely, there's going to be pockets of work that will probably be accelerated at different times and where the opportunities allow. It's probably about the same size as two New York cities. That's one way to think of it. It's about 170,000 hectares. Hectares is about the size of a rugby pitch there or thereabouts. It overlaps with our national designations. So it's, um, it's um, this is the important thing, I guess. You know, where we have seen areas protected by our, our best designations, so triple SIs and SPAs, that's where we see the greatest benefits in terms of genuine protection for wildlife. And they're typically well managed as well. That's really important. What we would find is that something like a world heritage status doesn't change what those provide it layers on that global consideration that kind of global commitment if you like and recognizes internationally the level of importance that there is on these sites so that's that's how it works and so it must be obviously a lot of uh, mileage of coastline um but one thing that I think of straight away is two things, actually. One thing I'm thinking of straight away is is accessibility. Now, you know, we're talking about areas which some are very sensitive. And it's, is it only for, for migratory birds or are we talking about places that are also used by breeding birds like terns and, you know, shorebirds that use the, uh, the, the beaches? And if so... It would be both. No, absolutely. Okay. And if so, what's, what's the deal when it comes to to accessibility because I've been on the coasts many times and I've been in despair watching people let let their dogs just run um and chase birds off yeah. the beach and stuff. How how do you police that? Because it's all very well having those, you know, those designated areas, but if people aren't gonna be sort of playing ball and actually sort of res respecting the fact that there's breeding birds there, where does that leave us? Mm. I mean, great question. It's a great question. And it's been one that's, um, it's been a lot of work on this in the last year or so, actually. And it's, um, it's one of the challenges of our time. So we know that accessibility, i.e. access to nature is critical for us to care about it, to be bought into it, to be um, in many ways able to have that care to want to do something about it. So that's really, that's a real challenge if you don't have that. But at the same time, we know that much of our wildlife has now reduced, if you like, to these pockets. And these pockets are typically these protected areas. They're incredibly vulnerable then to the levels of disturbance that there might be if it isn't managed well or if people don't conduct their affairs, if you like, how you need them to for, for this precious wildlife. And sometimes it's just they simply don't know. But, um, you know, we saw this really come into focus through the lockdown period of COVID, actually. That was fascinating. So through my time with the IRA, SPB, we looked very carefully at wasn't it wonderful people got to connect with their local areas again and that was brilliant but then we also saw people you know climbing onto turn rafts for example and treating them like stand-up paddle boards or you know we found people you know walking their dogs in places where you got you know schedule one protected birds again much of it was purely because they just didn't know it was there so there's a really important communications job there it's not always just about education and communication, though, because you can shout to your blue in the face, but some people won't do necessarily what you're asking. And so there's got to be more than that. And so there's other techniques and important things that we need to do. So this kind of accessibility disturbance issue is always going to be a challenge for us. And what I would say is that, you know, there's definitely some really good practice that we've seen in certain places. It's not always just about fencing people out and keeping them away. There's a lot of really important sort of community embedded work that you can do. And you've almost got to try and turn 
the problems into the solution. You've got to try and find a way to get those people that are coming there because they love the place to realize why else it's important. And then when they start to love it for that reason, the self-policing comes along, if you like, that's really important too. But there isn't a silver bullet to this at the moment. And there's no doubt that there are scenarios where this is a really big challenge. And then there are scenarios where we're seeing some benefits. It's not just dog walking. You can see that there's, say, drones. There's sometimes different types of recreation. And we've got the science. We know that certain birds are incredibly vulnerable to disturbance. So particularly the ground nesting species or the species that use camouflage. Um, so these cryptic species that need to protect themselves from other predators, for example, when they're flushed from those nests, then they can become vulnerable. And what I would say, though, is that there's um, a lot of work this last few years. We've done some projects on the beach, for example, Plovers in Peril. Um, it's been a project on that Norfolk coastline. And over the last three years, we've seen massive increases in some of those beach nesting birds. A lot of work has been put in by staff on the ground, working with people, then volunteers, then local communities, Lots of fencing in places, but targeting that in a way which is maybe more um, specific to where you've got the individual nests. And that's one way to actually manage it in a different way. But these are all things that need to be continually worked on. So a big challenge, and I can't fix it in five minutes for you here, but I think you're right. It's a really important one to work through. But your kind of first part of that question was, what does it include? And it absolutely does. So if you look at that East Coast wetland, we're talking about a really diverse array of habitats even within that sort of wetland context because you're kind of going from a marine environment all the way through to a terrestrial environment and so you've got everything from important fish stocks to the important mollusks and invertebrate assemblages then all the way through the salt marshes up into if you like the grazing marsh or the wetlands the the freshwater areas that are adjacent to the, the coast and that's really important what we have seen is that when we have these wetlands that are adjacent to the coastline, when you get the high tides, you get the high tide roosts where the birds can then, you know, roost, rest, you know, and feed sometimes. And those are really critical on the part of their journey. So you've got to look at the, a much bigger buffer than just saying we're going to protect the mudflats. That's really important. And you're right. It's not just about protecting what you've got and thinking, OK, which way does it coming and how are we going to make sure there's enough food for them? It's knowing that throughout the spring and the autumn, there's absolutely hundreds of thousands of birds passing through. But throughout the middle of the year, there's a lot of birds that are breeding. And again, globally important populations of birds. We know that in you know the UK and particularly in England, along that coastline are seabirds, are coastal birds that are um, associated with beach nesting, for example, really, really important. So little tern populations, sandwich tern populations, go a bit further north and you've got roseate tern colonies as well. And then you can go into the harder cliff lines, if you like, where we know that these are important places for gannets, fulmars, you know, kittiwake. So it's really the first thing is, wow, you know, we've got such an incredible coastline. And I think the Wild Isles program that happened earlier in the year that we worked on with WWF and the BBC uh, and the National Trust, it was a great landmark for us. We've been working on it for a long time, but just to get that, hang on a minute, what we've got is incredible. And there was some footage from that film uh, that series of films which demonstrated on our coast when you look at like the wash and you see you see all of the, the millions of birds quite literally but the thousands of not all huddling together at somewhere like Snettersham it's just breathtaking so yeah. yeah it's all of those things yeah you talk about wild isles I mean I had one issue with that I mean yeah fantastic but the main issue I had with that series was that was very little if any attention paid to urban areas and I think that you know, mm -hmm. in order for people to understand your project, for people to understand nature in general, you need to understand what's in front of you. And most of us live in urban areas. Yeah. It just pains me. Like, yeah, again, it's kind of ignored or relegated to just foxes and feral pigeons. Um, so that was mm -hmm. one of my main gripe of that. It was a fantastic series, don't get me wrong, in terms oh, of the photography. I hear you. But I think you need to link yeah. it back. It's important to link it back and some of these coastal areas are in fact urban you know i'm actually mm. in brighton now that's an urban area with a coastline yeah you know? um yeah. So for me that's a, a an element that i think needs to be concentrated on a bit more to get our message out yeah no i totally agree i think no you you're absolutely right 
you know, it's um, it's the nature on people's doorstep. I mean, I, I grew up in Essex and I'm in and out of London quite a bit. We've got family that live in Cam Camden and um, and we're there a lot. Uh, I, I'm just mesmerised by the wildlife that I can see that I can bring to life with people that are in the city as well. And it's sometimes that first step on the journey to seeing other places. But the um, yeah, it's not like the wildlife is just in the countryside. It's it's also in those urban places. And you know that better than anyone. I've been able to bring that to life. So it's it's brilliant. So, yeah. I'll definitely take that back. That's a really, really, yeah, it's an important bit of feedback. And I think that's more that we can do. Green space is really important. How we connect people to wildlife on their doorstep. Absolutely. But it's recognised naturally that these places are all along that network of the East Coast. You're right. There's a lot of there's a lot of urban places within that. And there's a lot of industrial areas, too. There's a lot of places which, like I said, they don't necessarily feel like a natural sort of like semi-natural habitat but they are thriving with wildlife and people are there and you've got to put them right at the heart of it. Absolutely. I mean, I've seen that in Salt Home, for example, up in, uh, where is that? Salt Home. Yeah. No, I've got right. Yeah, there. Salt Home up on Teesside. It's had its, um, yeah, it's had its very best year for breeding waders this last year. It's going great. Really, really great. But yeah, you're there at Salt Home, surrounded by a lapwing, red shank. There's even, I think, bitten there as well that have been turning up in their reed bed. They've got, you know, stacks of wildlife and then all around you is this massive industrial sort of like backdrop. And that juxtaposition is really, really interesting. But, you know, that's where, you know, nature is sometimes fitting in around the edges of what we do as humans, if you like. So whether it's agriculture, whether it's development, you know, whether it's industry and it's just trying to sort of make sure we we find the ways to both carry and live in sort of like um, coexistence, but then also making sure that there is genuine space for nature because it's squeezed it's really squeezed and I think that's my fear if you like you know I am someone that's an ever ever the optimist but my fear that I can see if we don't act in a way on the east coast wetlands whereby we recognize the global importance and we start to adapt then unfortunately the sea level rise that occurs on the coast squeezes everything on one side and the fact that you know 70 percent of the land or more is is under some form of of um, agriculture and the rest of it is you know the fragments of where nature hangs on is reduced you're finding that that squeeze is just going to push things to the the fringes and that's why we've seen you know the the losses and the reductions in populations um, and that's not just species it's the numbers of things as well you know these dramatic declines 40 million birds disappeared over my lifetime alone you know and that's um and disappeared means that they're, they're gone you know it's not like you know that's a, a really sad fact that we've got that so my hope is that we make space for nature. You know, that's the key thing for me. Yeah. I mean, going back to Salt Home, uh, one of my favourite RSPB reserves and also um, the place where Ridley Scott was influenced, looking at that industrial scene, um, it, it influenced him with his film Blade Runner. So that's that was great. Um, what do other... I didn't know. That's a good fact. No, uh, You know, hang out with me, you know. Pub quiz, <laughs> you'll be winning lots of prizes, I'll tell you. Um, what do other countries, how do they deal with this kind of project? I mean, you were talking about China, for example. Do they have the similar mm. sort of how to do things or how does it differ? Or, or, yeah, or no, there's, there's a lot of similarities. Like them? Yeah, I mean, so my experience... Um, I've got a few different types of international experience, I guess, from where I've gone to take what I've learned or contributed something and then and then brought back some learning too. I think that what we can see is that, you know, so there are other places along that East Coast flyway, places like the Wadden Sea, for example, which are already, you know, they're a part of that world heritage status. And you can see that, you know, the, ta the challenges that, you know, the Netherlands has faced over many, many years of where people live and how they farm and then how they protect land and then how they're very creative. And we've brought so many of their wind pumps and sort of solutions for hydraulics and um, and how we would um, approach hydrology more. Um, you know, that's been a, a, a long term thing. But what, what I have seen personally is that when I worked in China, for example, I worked at a place called... Um, Chongming Dongtang, which is a national nature reserve just outside Shanghai. So it's one of the largest sedimentary islands, if not the largest sedimentary island that's just sitting in the uh, the Yellow River that just comes out south of China, um, Shanghai, sorry, in China. And um, we were invited there to have a look at where they needed to do um, a significant 
nature restoration job um, which was associated with managing what's called um, Spartina. So there was a non-native plant species that was introduced to the area and it was starting to basically work its way across all of the mudflats. Now, in the same way I've just described uh, like our East Coast and how important it is for birds, you've got like a mirror image. You know, you've got birds that are flying from, you know, New Zealand and Australasia up across that China coast and all the way up to, um, you know, all the way up to, to, to Siberia. And some of the really important species that we've seen globally and have kind of been brought to life, you know, um, in over over here in some of our storytelling has been things like the, the spoon-billed sandpiper. Um, so a tiny little bird with, with with an incredible beak. It's got like a little spoon for a bill. And um, and what we found is that that bird was was really on a, on the edge. I mean, very close to extinction. You could see that there was the classic thing with with any form of nature conservation is you've got to look at what do they need to feed? Where do they need for breeding? And what is it that's going to probably, you know, end their life, if you like? And if you can try and work on those three things, you know, you've got a chance of of turning something around. And we could see that across that sort of um, stretch of, of coastline, that there was um, a real threat that you were going to lose the mudflats because the Spartina was working its way across. And there was an incredible project there, massive project, more than 20,000 hectares on one sort of site um, was a national nature reserve. And they had a 4,000 hectare project of restoration. So my previous experience in working with particularly um, what I would term sort of muck shifting. So taking X mineral sites and then turning them into wetlands, reed beds and things, is that I'd done a lot of work with contractors to work out how to design habitats that are gonna be wetland sites, and then how to work with the, the contractors, the bulldozers, the diggers, the excavators to do those things at scale. And again, RSBB has done that and, and done that really well for, for many a year now. So probably 20, 30 years of experience of doing that, learning it, understanding it, and what we were doing is we were taking some of that learning and 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 helping our colleagues and and people that we'd um we'd made contact with over in China. Now we learned a huge amount too because some of the techniques and the quality of the engineering was just incredible. So I took a huge amount back from that. Um, but I was there really to try and help on the basis of what we saw in some of the the work abroad was that nature conservation is quite commonly about. Um, protecting the best areas that there already is, but the restoration of new habitat, creating something from scratch was something that's still quite new in, in other parts of the globe. And I think that's where we were able to bring and share something from an RSPB perspective in the UK, where this creation of habitat was something. And I've got to say the most important thing is to just stay calm, like keep calm and carry on is like a really good phrase in this one, because when you're doing these kind of projects, you, you're kind of almost turning something into like a lunar landscape and you're kind of, you're fearful that it's ever going to work out but you know once you work out what you need to create how you sort of um you work with the um the designers the engineers and you understand what the species require i'd say it's probably one of the best projects i've ever worked on and probably ever will be because it was such a scale and when i went back it was multiple years that i was working with them there and um and i've just got to you know say hats off they invested heavily to deal with an in non-native invasive species but the creation of wetland habitat that was going to act as feeding roosting and breeding and there's now new geographical populations of things like saunders gull um, they had completely new breeding species there you know a variety of waders but importantly to give you the sense of scale i went there and looked at the scrapes and the habitats that we made and we had like ten thousand dundlin arriving all at once just landing on the the newly created habitat that we'd all worked on together and it was just a great feeling thinking that there was probably one spoon-billed sandpiper hidden amongst there somewhere. Um, and, and so there, I, I've seen some great work. And I think that this protection of places, the World Heritage Sites, you know, the International Wetlands Day, these are all things that are taken up with great um, consideration in many places across the world. And I think that we've got to really continue to, you know, think globally and act locally. So you you create that interconnected sort of understanding of what is it that the planet needs and how can we all learn from each other to try and then act locally in a way which is going to be connected. And the reality is that other really important phrase, you know, is that the birds don't know borders. You know, we've got birds that are arriving in the UK. We think that they're UK birds. They're, they're from the Arctic or they're from Africa. You know, they're from everywhere. It's like, you know, th this is a really important thing to, to sort of, I think, everyone to keep their head on to because um, that bigger picture is really, really important.
Yeah, it is indeed. And you're right. When you see, you know, the work being done at first, you think, oh, my God. And especially when you're not involved in that work and you just see the scarring of the land, you think, what are you guys doing? You know, but actually there's a plan right. to it. As you say, it's when it works, it works superbly. I must must tell you about my um, experience with um, Spoonbill Sandpiper. I remember being in um, Thailand and I went to this salt, pa salt pan area called Pak Tali, which is a very famous spot for, for people to go and see it. And I remember, I mean, it's a long story, but the bit I want to tell you is that I was um, I was looking at a particular salt pan with my scope and I came across a bird amongst a bunch of other sort of redneck stints and stuff, which I thought could have been a, um, uh, a spoonbill sandpiper. And these um, beds were actually kind of on mounds. So I thought, I didn't want to disturb it, I'm, but I need to get closer. So I started crawling on the floor on all fours, army style with my tripod. So I didn't want to break the horizon of the uh, the, the embankment. Um, the ground was gritty and I was, my knees were being shredded to pieces. But I thought, no, I'm doing this in the name of science. And plus I don't want to disturb these birds. And I was really in pain. And as I crawled along, I looked to my right and a pair of legs walked past me. A guy, a camera a photographer just looked at me, laughed and carried on walking. And I realized I didn't have to do that. And I just looked up and the birds were, wouldn't have flown anyway. But I guess I was trying to be <laughs> as respectful as possible. Um, <laughs> Brilliant. Let me um, ask you about Wallacea. Um, that was one of the things I first heard about years ago. Ah, oh, the RSPB are building some kind of, or we're creating some sort of habitat in Essex, but it's all fenced mm. off. You can't get in there. And I thought, Actually, it sounds like an amazing thing because it seemed like a big place that you're working on. But then I heard that, uh, was it Crossrail was involved um, in terms of, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. And for those who don't know, maybe who don't live in the UK, I mean, amongst conservationists, they weren't the sort of loveliest of people. We didn't actually love them like HS2. Um, they were sort of, uh, as far as we were concerned, destroying habitat like HS2 but then trying to mitigate it by giving, you know, giving to this project. So I felt a little bit uncomfortable with all of that. And I'm sure that maybe one or two other people may have felt the same as well. So can you just talk us briefly through that project and, and you know, about Crossrail's inv involvement with it? Yeah, no, no, sure. Yeah, it's, um, it's an amazing project. I've been to see it a few times now, and we actually, we twinned it with some of the work that we did in Chongming Dong Tan actually that was one of the key things that we did because it was um it was a template for some of the stuff that we've learned and been able to deliver so you can find out about Wallace Island on um it's part of the rewilding network um so it's um, a part of that family that kind of looks at how you do things at scale and try and restore natural processes um it's on that sort of Essex coastline not far from South End um, and the, the the island itself was was kind of like under agriculture and the sea defences around the perimeter um, were failing to stop that flooding from occurring. But importantly, there's a lot of sort of technicalities with how you create these things. You're working out how much material you need or what the impact's going to be on the estuary, um, how the, you know, the, the hydrodynamics are going to work. So that kind of basically how the water's going to come in, how much do you need, how, when's it going to go out, what's the impact going to be, loads and loads of things like that. What's interesting is the um, when I did the work in in China, it was about sort of uh, creating and protecting areas, um, and and the creation of those habitats was um, was almost like you were having to dig out areas to try and create wetlands. The interesting thing with Wallace is that it was too low, so you had these failing sea defences, but what was behind it was too low. So if you were to breach it and let the water in, it would basically just be lost. So everything would be underwater. And I've, I've faced this similar situation in some of the wetland work that I've done before. So there's this really important sort of like um, topographical sort of like measurement that you need to work on, whereby you get the ideal height of the ground that you get relative to either the water level management that you can conduct or the tidal changes that you've got. And so the reason that Wallacey required this kind of opportunity to work with a partner is because it's a really, really big area, but you could see that doing this... Um, breaching of the seawalls, allowing the water to come in, it required us to find lots and lots of material. 
So we're either in the business of trying to lose material somewhere or find it from somewhere. And both are equally difficult. So if you're trying to take material from a site, you know, one of your go to's is like you're often asked, you should take it to landfill or something. You think, well, that's a real waste of that material and it's very expensive. Likewise, when you're looking for lots of material, it's often not there. But for for the right reasons, there was an opportunity to work with Crossrail. So they were tunneling underneath London. So the key thing that this was a relationship where we could see that the material that they were taking from looking at the underground, so looking at the new um, Elizabeth line, um, is that that material needed to go somewhere and it was going to be wasted. Um, and, and that was, I think, one of the key things. So where we've looked at where you take material and how you use it beneficially is one of the key things. Um, quick segue, it's another example on the East Coast where, for example, when you're working with ports or where you're dredging material, quite often that material is just sent out to sea. Whereas what we've now started looking at is the beneficial use of dredging. So you take that material and you create new habitat, which can then be a place where nesting turns can be. So this concept of taking material that would usually just be wasted or taken to somewhere else and not used for a positive gain, that was really at the heart of the concept for how we work with Crossrail. And so working with them meant that we ultimately, we're talking about a significant scale because they had a lot of material and we're talking about many, many hundreds of hectares of land and to bring that up significantly. And so there was um, fundamentally, there was a 24 seven sort of like industrial process of receiving, you know, material and then having that on big wagons, taking it out and then working it into places, direct placement, and then working with all the bulldozers and the, um, you know, the excavators, all with their laser leveling to try and shape that up to the right levels for a design that we knew that was going to work for wildlife. And it's and it's done it. It's one of the most stunning places. It's got a lot of accolades. It's big. And that's sometimes one of the things that benefits it. So the scale really helps. It's become a really important place for breeding avocet. It's become a really important place for roosting raptors over the winter still very important for a range of other invertebrates, amphibians and farmland birds as well, which are managed in with the, the way that the habitats manage more peripherally to it. So, I mean, there are some excellent people that work in the team that really, you know, they know their stuff when it comes to uh, the design or working with the contractors. And that's who's really made that place fly. But a lot of it sometimes comes down to the concept, the negotiation, brokering a deal, but having a vision for what you want to create. And I think that that's what's really made, you know, Wallacey special. So there's some important people, you know, the likes of Malcolm Alston and Jeff Q are two people that work in the RSPB that really made that place fly. And then there's lots of people that have managed it, lots of people, sorry, that have managed it since that are doing a great job at, at making that work. So it's um it's a really interesting site. And I think what it does provide, and one of the things that has come back to us from us putting forward our tentative um, nomination and um, an accepted nomination for the tentative list for world heritage status is that the um, what's termed the um, the outstanding universal value of this area is in accordance with not only the abundance of wildlife that we have, but this demonstration of um, adaptation techniques that we've delivered across the coastline of which Wallacey is one of those great examples of where we've had innovation working with you know, industry in a novel way, but we've created a space for nature. So absolutely, when we're working with, you know, businesses, industry, you know, I've worked with the mineral industry, I've worked with, um, you know, a whole variety of, um, of, uh, of commercial partners as well. And we look through them very carefully. And I think one thing I would say is that I think at times we've always been incredibly cautious to work only with those that are doing absolutely the very, very best for nature at all times. And, you know, why wouldn't you? Why would you not want to sort of make sure you're working with those people with that intention? But I think an important point is to recognise that you might not change the world if you only work with those that are already working at that level. And so it's important to see where you can work with others, not to greenwash, but importantly, to identify where you can find that mutual benefit, that opportunity to learn, but that demonstration of what the art of the possible is. And I think that's what we were trying to seek to do with Crossrail. And I think that the end product does help us with that. So that's 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 the short form. But there is, again, there's lots more information on the Internet that, that kind of goes with that story. But hopefully that brings a little bit of it to life. Yeah. OK, well, I, you know, I totally agree with you in the respect of actually talking to people who 
may have been deemed as the enemy um, to 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 try and you know make things or make some of the things good. Um, we are kind of uh, we've it's actually... still a limit though. I agree, I do agree with you though. That there's still a limit. You know, there's there's some lines, and you you know, there's judgment calls to make. Yeah. And I think that we always face those, and there will be more more opportunities for us to test that. You know, there's um, you know, if we if you bring it right now to modern like right now, if you try and read, I would say the nation's perspective on how things are. This, like I said at the very beginning, that interest in the climate, that interest in nature is at its highest. What we've seen is that the country at large is really worried about our our wetlands, really worried about our rivers and our bathing waters. The issue of sewage has been a really significant consideration for, for the public at large. And it's just, again, then looking at, well, how do you address that? How do you turn the problem into a solution? It's not easy, but I think that that's, that's where you've got to try and get to. So I think there's so much more that needs to be done. And unfortunately, um, yeah, it's it's a challenge sometimes to, to work out how and where you work. But I do believe that if you're going to make a difference, it's going to have to be around collaboration. Yeah, totally. And I must actually get myself down there. I'd love to visit and and see that site because um, I've heard a lot about it. So uh, one day I will definitely get down there. Now, Michael, what's your yeah, no, I'll meet you there. Sorry? Yeah, absolutely. We'll hang out. Yeah. Um, what is your favourite bird, Michael? Oh, oh, that's like asking you what's your favourite child. Oh my gosh! Um, it's an easy answer. Okay, I would say technically, I've got <laughs> I've got a massive soft spot, a massive soft spot for a long tail tit. I think it's just the most stunning little ball of fluff with the longest tail. I love the fact that it bounces along a little family group. You can hear it coming along, and when they come into the garden, it's just like a little troop of joy. So I'd I'd go with that. Yeah, love that phrase, troop of joy. It's lovely. And uh, if you could be anywhere on this planet right now, where would you be? Oh, just with my family, you know, with my family. And um, and in all honesty, if it was a place geographically, I still have a massive soft spot for the nature reserve that's just around the corner from me. You know, my heart was poured into it when I was working there. It's now run by other people, you know, in our SPB family. But I still sneak out there in the evenings and... Um, and it's a place where there's now bitterns booming and marsh harriers and bearded tits. And um, and I spend a lot of time up there in the evening with my family. That's um, a sunset over Langford Lowfields. That's where I'd like to be. Cool. OK. All right. Zoomers, just to let you know that um, we've got a couple more um, in conservation myths to come um, before Christmas and Santa comes. Um, one of the ones I'm really excited about is actually next Monday on on the 18th of December, we're talking to the world-renowned Ken Kaufman, who is a god uh, in uh, US uh, ornithology. Um, basically, uh, the uh, American Ornithological Society, or I, th I think that's their names, um, have decided to change the names of all the birds who have uh, been named by people uh, to more descriptive names. What do you think about that? Come and join that debate. It's going to be very interesting. Um, we've got um, Mark Thomas, another colleague of yours, actually, um, from the RSPB uh, on Tuesday the 19th, talking about the bird crime report as well. So I think they're the last two other than tomorrow, which is Gina Nickel talking about running nature tours in the US uh, brackets as a woman, because I think she's one of the very few women running tour companies, nature tour companies in the US. So that's all to come. It's been a, a really fascinating evening. In fact, one of the... Uh, the Zoomers, Dennis has already said, but this hour has felt like 30 minutes and I actually agree. I could keep on talking with you, Michael. And I think we need to do that at Wallasey um, one day next year, without a doubt. So I can actually see this amazing flyway in action. Um, thank you for your time tonight. No, it's been a pleasure. Really, really love to catch up. And yeah, thank you for your time as well, David. It's always been lovely to spend time with you. So yeah, we'll do that. Superb. Zoomers, thank you very much. It's been fantastic having you around as ever. And you know what? Keep looking up.